You know, before I close my comments, I want to take a brief moment to address a pressing issue for the state of Oklahoma and how it will define our future for the next 15 years and beyond. I truly believe Oklahoma is more unique than any other state in the nation. We are a land of promise, of hope, and of prosperity for all. We are home to tribes like the Comanche Nation, who have called Western Oklahoma home since the early 18th century, and many tribes who traveled the Trail of Tears in the 1820s, and tribes like the Oto Missouri tribe, who arrived as late as 1881. We are home to African Americans who created 50 cities across Oklahoma, beginning as early as 1865. And with their freedoms, they made Oklahoma the epicenter of a new economy and new economic institutions, such as the Black Wall Street in the early 20th century. And we are home to the numerous young families who traveled from across North America to be part of the land run in 1889 as they established new farmlands and discovered the benefits of cultivating our natural resources. In 1907, Oklahoma's state constitution received overwhelming support from voters of both Oklahoma and Indian territories. On the day of statehood, Oklahoma was represented by Charles C. Jones, who called this day a matrimonial ceremony, one to which no divorce can ever be granted. With thousands in attendance, a marriage ceremony was performed to cast a vision for one Oklahoma. Charles Haskell, the first governor of Oklahoma, said at the ceremony that the new union was not placed in our Constitution as a political requirement, nor for mere sentimental purposes, but because a majority of the people believe that humanity will be bettered by it. In 1907, Oklahomans believed we were better for being one people, one economy, one unified state. When I came into office, two major events unfolded that have become a monumental test of this marriage. First, the U.S. Supreme Court took up the McGirt v. Oklahoma case and reviewed whether a violent child rapist could be tried in state court when the crime had been committed in Indian country. The Supreme Court wrestled with Oklahoma's history and whether Congress had ever de-established the Indian reservations that had previously covered up much of the land. Second, I also inherited letters from tribes stating that Oklahoma's most significant compact in a century, the 2004 Gaming Compact, was outdated and expiring on January 1, 2020. This 2004 Gaming Compact established a $9.8 billion industry. It gave Oklahoma tribes exclusive access to market competitive Las Vegas style games in a one size fits all approach. In return, the state would not exert any meaningful oversight over Indian gaming. The state also acknowledged the sufficiency of a gentleman's agreement, namely four cents paid on each dollar earned by the tribes would go to public education. This agreement remains unlike any of the other 40 compacts Oklahoma governors and individual tribes have entered into in our history. As you know, last month, the U.S. Supreme Court determined that Oklahoma's Indian reservations, more than a century after statehood, are still intact in some form. And the U.S. District Court recently ruled that the 2004 Gaming Compact is left to exist forever until a small state agency declines to issue gaming licenses to the horse racing tracks in Oklahoma, which are now owned by two of Oklahoma's largest tribes. I might add that the state agency is required to issue those licenses on an annual basis. Within a matter of one week, the courts have put Oklahoma in a position where we must face questions of constitutional proportions. How will the state of Oklahoma or its municipalities regulate? Can the state ensure a level playing field for all businesses? Who will pay taxes? Who won't? How will the state fund core public services that are assessed by all 4 million Oklahomans, no matter their race, gender, citizenship, or socioeconomic status. 
I am disappointed by the court's rulings, but we cannot allow the courts to divide us essentially into two or more states with divided citizenship and differing sets of rules on how to conduct business. I am hopeful that we can forge a stronger future if we remember what Oklahomans set forth to do in 1907, to establish one state and to secure a stable, sustainable, and vibrant future for the betterment of all Oklahomans. I know this is possible because I have sat at the table with a number of our tribal partners. We crafted a new gaming agreement with the mission to benefit all 4 million Oklahomans. And we negotiated with tribes that each reflect the immense diversity of size, geography, and needs of tribal citizens. With a fresh slate, we achieved a fair market rate for Las Vegas-style games doubling the highest rate found in the 2004 gaming compacts from 6% to 13%. We established clear auditing and transparency measures to protect the integrity of the compact and ensure the trust of all Oklahoma citizens. We restored dispute resolution language to keep future negotiations out of costly court battles. Our new gaming compacts were affirmed by the U.S. Department of Interior and showed when the state and tribes are at the table together, we can achieve better public policy and healthier relationships. This was an important journey for all of us, but now we must look at where we go from here. What I can speak to today is that my convictions remained unchanged. When I ran for office, I committed to bring a fresh set of eyes to state contracts. I committed to bring more accountability to state government and to address bureaucratic structures that diminish the voice of ordinary Oklahomans. I presented Oklahoma with a vision to become a top 10 state, to pursue solutions that would deliver a more prosperous future for the next generation of Oklahomans. But I cannot do this alone. It is why two weeks ago I instructed state agencies to look at how the U.S. Supreme Court's decisions could have an impact on how they deliver public services. Agencies like the Oklahoma Department of Human Services with its foster care programs and the Oklahoma Department of Transportation with its future expansion of public roads and bridges. The agencies will share these reports with the commission I established of Oklahoma's finest trailblazers. They have already begun meeting and discussing ways to protect our union and strengthen our future as one state. As it pertains to both federal court rulings, I am in discussion with elected leaders in the state house and state senate about how this impacts our budget and shapes policy debates going into the 2021 session. And I have also reached out to various tribal leaders and I have returned to traveling the state every week. This is no small task we face as a state. Where we go from here will define an entire generation, which is why I will continue to listen and will remain committed to communicating every step of the way.